lovely to um, be here with you again. I was asked originally if I could preach at the evening service today. And I thought I'll just manage to get it up in time for that. And then they moved it to the morning service. So it's nice to be with you. I'm going to preach from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14 all the way to the end of chapter 13. You'll notice that chapter 12 verse 14 and chapter 13 verse 1 begins, this is my third visit to you. Paul is getting to the conclusion of his letter, so we're going to deal with the conclusion of his letter this morning. So let's pray before we dive into the scriptures. Heavenly Father, your Holy Spirit has inspired the scriptures. We are so privileged to be able to read the inspired authoritative, infallible words of God. We thank you and we pray for the help of your Holy Spirit that we might handle the scriptures correctly. And we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit that we might put these things into practice and our lives would never be the same again as a result of your dealings with us through your word this morning. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the middle of the Second World War, Ernie Palnock lay bleeding, injured on the battlefields of Europe. He was 19 or 20 years of age. And as he was wounded on the ground, Bleeding, he cried out to God. He had prayed many times to commit his life to the Lord, but it hadn't been real. But here, as he thought he might be dying, he, he prayed that God would take his life and that he would be committed to Jesus Christ forever. And he prayed that if God rescued his life, then God would give him a sign, a symbol of some kind, so that he would always remember his commitment to Jesus Christ and that it would be real. Now Ernie was a good friend of mine, and he actually preached at Lansdowne at a missionary weekend in Harry Kilbride's day. Old enough to be my dad, indeed looked a little bit like my dad, poor guy, but he was rescued on the battlefields of Europe, taken to some makeshift hospital, stitched up. And he said the most incredible thing was that he only had one real scar as a result of his injuries. There, by his thumb, on his right hand, was a scar like a cross. And he felt that this was the answer to his prayer, that God had given him a sign like a cross on his hand to remind him of his commitment. But by the time the war was over, he had wandered from his commitment. He had grown cold, dropped out of Christian fellowship, just living a worldly lifestyle. And he was with his mates in the pub. And he said he was there at the bar and he picked up his tankard of beer and that weakness in his hand caused him to kind of twitch and drop it and spilt it everywhere. And he saw that cross on his hand. And he remembered. And he felt terrible because something had fractured his relationship with God. And now he was living as if God just didn't really matter at all, as if God didn't really exist at all. So he left the pub. He went back to where he was staying. He got down on his knees and he pleaded with God for mercy. He recommitted his life to Jesus Christ and was restored spiritually. A similar thing has happened to the Corinthians here in 2 Corinthians. They had been doing really, really well. 
Things had gone really, really wrong, and now they were just limping along spiritually. And so Paul says in chapter 13 and verse 11, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Full restoration. Restoration. Now, we know what he means by full restoration, don't we? He means to be just like Jesus, to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, to be complete in Christ, to be keeping in step with the Spirit. I saw a lady as I was driving down here this morning, walking her dog, and how the dog was keeping in step with her. And I thought, this is what we need to be doing with Jesus Christ. We need to be keeping in step with him every step along the way. We need to be revived. We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need full restoration. Now, we know what he means, but why does he use this strange phrase, full restoration? Indeed, it's such a strange phrase that some versions don't translate it as full restoration. They just paraphrase it, aim for perfection, something like that. Why does Paul use this strange phrase? Because it's a phrase that was used when someone broke a bone. There you are, you've been in your car crash, your leg has been completely shattered, and so you need to get it restored. So you go to the hospital and they in it and they put a plaster around it and bit by bit your leg gets better until it's fully restored and you can come to church and you can come up the front afterwards and you can do a you can play leapfrog or something because you're fully restored and Paul is saying to the Corinthians we want you to be fully restored spiritually you remember what you were like when you were first converted things have gone wrong Now, get back to being fully restored. So I have two points for my sermon. You'll be pleased. The first is, don't settle for fractured religion. That's chapter 12, verse 14, all the way through to chapter 13, verse 10. Fractured religion, that breaking in the spiritual relationship. You remember Pilgrim's Progress. You remember the story of when Christian and Hopeful were walking along and it was hard work and it was uphill and it was rocky. It wasn't pleasant at all. And they were really struggling. They just looked over the hedge and they saw that there was a lovely meadow there and there was a path just running and it seemed to be running parallel to the path they were walking on. And so they thought they would just nip over the fence and walk where it was much nicer on Bypass Meadow. You remember what happened? The storm came and they had to hide. And then as they were hiding, giant despair came and got them. And then if despair wasn't enough, he came and he threw them in the dungeon of doubting castle and so now their life was bombarded with doubts and on every Sunday morning he would come down into the dungeon of doubting castle and he would get the uh, club the stick the branch of a crab apple tree and he would beat them savagely and tell them they may as well commit suicide because of the mess they've made of their lives they thought it was pleasant on bypass meadow it was horrendous And the Apostle Paul says, don't walk on bypass meadow. Don't settle for fractured religion. I meet lots of people who tell me that once they were on fire for Jesus Christ, once they were running well, once they were truly committed, but, but my baby died. And I thought, well, if that's what God allows to happen to me, that's it. Or maybe they say to me that they lost their job. And as a result of losing their job, they they lost their their home and uh, their world just collapsed. If that's what following God means, well then, I've called it. Or they say they were in the church and the church had a terrible split. And they thought, well, if Christians could behave like that, I've had enough. Or they say my husband just ran off with someone else. And so, well, I just found it too much. So I've stopped following Jesus Christ 
closely. Now they give all those reasons why they have a fractured relationship with God. But they haven't given the true reason. You see, the true reason was not because their baby died or because their husband ran off or because they lost their job. The real reason is because they had bought into the false teaching that the false teachers that Paul was opposing in 2 Corinthians chapters 10 to 13 was teaching. These false teachers didn't preach the cross and the resurrection. They just preached heaven now. They said the Apostle Paul, well, he's only a second-rate apostle. And the reason he's so poor and the reason he's suffering and the reason he's always talking about the cross and those kind of things is because he doesn't know what we know. We know that God loves us so much, he wants to give us heaven now. You can have your bestest life now. You can have all the life that you want now. You can be uh, enjoying the glory of heaven today. And they bought into this. And when they found the sufferings come, they just collapsed. And so Paul tells us to come back to repentance, to come to the cross of Christ and to stop hobbling with broken relationship with God, but to come to full restoration, that even through the dark valleys we can walk safely. So, he says three things in th the, well, three paragraphs. The first paragraph, chapter 12, verses 14 to 18, he says, don't settle for superficial discipleship. Look at chapter 12, verse 14. Paul says, now I am ready to visit you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you because what I want is not your possessions, but you. These people thought that all the apostle Paul wanted was them to give money so he could go and give the money to those who were hungry in Jerusalem. He says, he says, I don't want your money. I don't want your possessions. God doesn't need your money. God isn't there looking at his bank account and saying, scratching his head saying, I don't have enough to give to others. We don't need your money. We need you to give your whole life to God. That's what's important. God doesn't need your money. You need to be totally committed to God. And I'm not asking you for your money. I'm asking you to give your whole life to Jesus Christ. This is what Simon Gilbo was preaching to us last Sunday, wasn't it? How many of us attempted to think, okay, I put my money in the offering and I've been to church and I'm gonna come to a midweek meeting, God's happy with me because I'm giving him the fag ends of my life. Isn't God pleased with me? And God says, look at the cross. I gave my son to suffer and bleed and die. He who was rich beyond all telling, all for love's sake, became poor. And he bore all hell for you. And you're happy to give him an hour on Sunday morning and hope it's not too long because you want to enjoy the rest of the day for yourself. Paul says, I don't want, God doesn't want your possessions. He wants you. Frances Ridley Havergal realized this, didn't she? And she wrote that hymn, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my silver and my gold, take my intellect, take my heart, take myself, take the whole of me. And then she wrote a book on it, which she said, kept for the master's use. Take, keep my life and let it be always only all for thee. And Gypsy Smith had been a great preacher in the first half of the last century, but he died and his widow was a great singer. And they had about a, a seven or eight year old child. And, and so she was asked to sing and she uh, wanted to leave her kiddie in the congregation, but he didn't want to be sat on his own. So he came out and stood beside her as she was singing. And she was singing, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And when she got to the second or third verse, her little boy started pulling at her skirt. And so she was getting a bit annoyed. 
but you know, she was being spiritual. Take my voice and let me sing ever only for my king. And he was like, tug, 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 tug. And she was so worried that something really embarrassing was about to happen that she stopped singing and asked him what it was. And he said, Mummy, if you keep giving everything away, we'll have nothing for ourselves. And he understood. When we sing, take my life, we're giving everything to God. Everything to the King of Kings who gave himself for us. So what if God calls you to go and be a missionary in Afghanistan or Burundi or Iran or Nigeria? Would you rather be in the comforts of England, outside of the will of God? Or would you rather be in the will of God, whatever? If God calls me to give all my savings to an orphanage in Bulgaria, what am I going to do? Am I going to say, Lord, I want you plus the security of my bank account. Or do I say, Jesus Christ plus nothing is enough. Paul said, I don't want your possessions, I want you. Well, that was the first part, first point of point one. <sighs> point one, sub point two. <laughs> so the first one, don't settle for superficial religion. Don't settle for superficial discipleship. Second paragraph, chapter 12, verses 19 to 21. Don't settle for hypocritical discipleship. We're now moving from the superficial. God, you know, I, I don't want a full tank of spiritual petrol. Just give me a little bit. So now we're going to that which is hypocritical. Look at verses, um, well, let's start at verse 19. Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? We have been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ. And everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you and I will be grieved over the many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery. You see, what's happening here is these people are holding on to Jesus Christ and they're holding on to the sins of the sinful nature. And they're saying they want both. Oh, yes, they want heaven, and they want forgiveness, and they want Christ, and they want sin, and they want filth, and they want evil. And Paul says, what I'm doing is for your strengthening. You know what an oak tree is like? The winds come, and it blows through the area, and all the little saplings, they all bend before the wind, but the oak stands strong. And the apostle Paul says, I don't want you to be hypocrites, I want you to be strong. So when the winds of temptation, whether it's discord or whether it's immorality or whether it's selfish ambition and greed, when the winds come, you don't just bend before it, but you stand strong for Jesus Christ. Don't be a hypocrite who's got one foot in one camp and the other foot in the other camp, but be out and out for Jesus Christ. We knew a girl once who was living a godless lifestyle. She said she was a Christian. She said she was uh, a follower of Jesus Christ and she was living the most godless lifestyle imagine. And so we spoke to her and she said, oh, it doesn't matter because when I sin, I just go home and repent. You know, and tomorrow I will sin and then I'll go home and repent. It doesn't matter that I sin. She didn't understand that number one, Repent doesn't mean just saying sorry. Repent means to realize this is wrong and to turn away from it and go in the opposite direction. And secondly, she didn't re realize that even repentance doesn't make things right. 
I mean, you can be on the top of a skyscraper and you can jump off and halfway down you can repent. And suddenly you float up to the... No, you don't. You smack at the bottom because actions have consequences. And Paul says, don't be a hypocrite. Don't think you can hold on to God with one hand and hold on to sin with the other. You can't. And then point one, subsection three, chapter 13, verses one to 10. Don't settle for artificial discipleship. We've gone from that which was superficial to that which was hypocritical now to that which is artificial. And these people weren't converted at all. They were going along to the church. They were going along and they were actually causing some problems. And the Apostle Paul says in chapter 13, verses 1 to 4, I'm going to have to come and exercise church discipline. We don't want to exercise church discipline. Our job is not to tear people down, but to build them up. But we cannot permit you to be living as an enemy of the cross and as a member of the church. He says, but church discipline is a last resort. So he says, we don't want to have to discipline you. So he says in chapter 13, verse 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? He says we don't want hip, um, artificial discipleship. We want you to know, number one, that you are in the faith. What we sang, I believe in God the Father. I believe these things. And not only do you believe these things, but you have received Christ Jesus as your Lord. Christ is living in you. There's now that spiritual life in you. What Henry Scougal in that book that affected George Whitfield so much wrote, he called his book The Life of God in the soul of man. We have the life of God in us. Some years ago, we, um, one of our young teenage girls was baptized and um, she was on fire for the Lord. And I was um, on the pavement and a car pulled up beside me and it was the girl's mum. And she wound down the window and she leaned across to talk to me and she said, Chris, she said, and she started to cry. She said, I used to be like my daughter is now, but it's gone. I've grown cold. I'm not there. And by God's grace, she repented. She was fully restored. And today, she and her daughter are both very valuable workers in the kingdom of God. Don't settle for fractured religion. So my second point, chapter 13, verse 11. Strive for full restoration. Look at chapter 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. <clears throat> and the first thing I have to tell you is that you can't. All right, <laughs> you can't do it in your own strength. Just run back to chapter 13 and verse 9. Paul says, we're glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is that you may be fully restored. He prays to God that they might be fully restored. Because the only way you can be fully restored is not by looking in you to the strength that is in you, but to be crying out to God for the strength that he gives. And it's only when we are strong in the Lord and in his mighty power that we can live fully restored on this earth. Maybe you were like me. And for years, you thought that you would have the strength to live a fully restored spiritual life yourself. 
and you would fall into sin and you would be so grieved and you would, you would make a vow to the Lord that you would never do this again. And you started praying enthusiastically and studying your Bible zealously and being committed to the church. And a few weeks later, the same temptation would come by and you would just be knocked for six. And you would be so grieved and you would repent and you would get up and you would say to the Lord, Lord, I vow never to do this again. And I'm going to read my Bible more and I'm going to pray more. And then you fall again. And your life, and you seem to think, well, you know, temptation is just too strong for me. I cannot live fully restored. Ah, we just pretend that's what it is. We just pretend that we come to church and we spray on a nice spiritual face and we sit there and we pretend that we are living the victorious Christian life. And then we realize that, yeah, in our own strength, we, we, in our own strength, we can't even put to death our sinful nature. We can't even, we're not even stronger than our sinful nature let alone stronger than the forces of hell and Satan and temptation. We cannot do it in our own strength. And so some people have just given up and they've become legalistic Pharisees just pretending. But with God's help, with God's strength, with God's mighty power, we can do it. So we need to learn to walk by faith where every day we're receiving his power, that this is the victory, Christ in us. So we must strive for full restoration. We can't do it in our own strength, but through faith and in his power, we can, we must, and we do. And it's important that I emphasize this because <laughs> there are some people who think they can do it in their own strength and they don't need to be relying upon God every moment and they just fail miserably. And there are those people who think that we don't have to strive, we just wait for God to do it. And they go for a conference and they just wait to be zapped. And it didn't really work, so they go to a different conference to try and get zapped by them. And then they come back to their church and their church really isn't good enough because they're still falling into sin. And so they go to another church and hope that that church is going to be the answer. And if they're part of that church, then they'll be spiritual. And they don't realize that they themselves aren't just to wait there for it to happen to them. They are to strive for full restoration themselves. How do we do this? Well, very briefly, first of all, we need to renew our minds. Paul says, be transformed through the renewing of your minds. Learn to think biblically. Learn to get the word of God so into your psyche that you think God's thoughts after him. So you realize that everything you do is to be done to the glory of God. How? And you study God's word to see what it means to live like Jesus. And then you filter this through into your life. What does it mean? What does it mean to go Christmas shopping to the glory of God? What does it mean when you have to sack someone at work that you sack them in a way that brings glory to God? What does it mean to drive your car to the glory of God? What does it mean to bring up your children to the glory of God? What does it mean to cook a meal to the glory of God? What does it mean to go to the gym to the glory of God? That everything we do, we do to the glory of God. We haven't just got a Sunday religion and then a, un, a, a non-spiritual weekly religion but we've learned to renew our minds to think biblically so that what God's will is becomes our will in every detail of our lives. Renew your mind. Secondly, guard your heart. Someone said the longest 18 inches is from the head to the heart. I remember a mission organization telling me about a person who had the head the size of a planet and the heart the size of a pea. Because they knew all these things and it just was knowledge that puffed up. And, Paul, and the, the psalmist says, my heart is stirred 
by a noble theme. And we need to have a heart that is warm. Oh, for a heart to praise my God. A heart from sin set free. A heart that always feels your blood so freely shed for me. A heart resigned, submissive, meek. You can sing the rest to yourself. We need our heart to be warmed. Look at the story of Ezekiel and find when Ezekiel sees a vision of the glory of God, he says, yippee, now I know what God is like. He falls on his face like a dead man before the glory of God. He humbles himself. Oh, that our heart is stirred. That it's not just head knowledge, but that our heart, we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And thirdly, activate your will. Renew your mind, guard your heart, activate your will. I'm going to do good works that God has created me to do. As I was listening to um, Debbie speak about high fives, I remembered the time when I was at a prayer meeting in Chesterfield. And the, we'd had someone who had always come and put the chairs out for the Bible studies and prayer meetings faithfully every week. But now he had gone to hospital. And it just said, you know, if someone else would like to do his job, that would be very, very nice. And one guy, he wasn't a member of the church, but he prayed, and he prayed quite enthusiastically that God would raise up someone to do this job. And I realized that this guy was retired. So afterwards, I went up to him, and I said, to, I said well, you know, it's nice to hear you praying fervently for someone to put out the chairs and everything. Why don't you do it? Oh, I don't come here to serve, he said. I just come here to worship. So I told him that the word worship and the word serve were exactly the same in the Greek. This is a Sunday morning service where we live to worship God, we live to serve God. And actually, if you're not willing to serve God, then you are incapable of worshiping God. We have been saved to do good works, that our life has an impact for God where he's placed us. Renew your mind. Guard your heart, activate your will, be fully restored. You know, if you are in a car crash and you have your legs smashed, you can go to the hospital and they can put a titanium plate on it or titanium rods in it. And titanium rods are five times stronger than bone. So it means actually your leg can be made even stronger than it was before. And there are some of us who think we have made such a mess of our lives, we have so fractured our relationship with God that there's nothing for us to do anymore. But we're just in the sin bin, we're off at the sidelines, we're just waiting to die. And Paul says, no, God's grace, you can be fully restored so you can be five times stronger than you've ever been before. Come back to the cross, come in repentance, to Christ and see what his mercy can do. But you know, it's not just be fully restored. Our conclusions here from chapter 13, verse 11 to 14, say, yeah, do sort yourselves out. Look at verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Yeah, sort yourselves out. But also be Useful in the church, verse 11, halfway through. Encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. He says, serve at the church, be friends in the church. Don't just sort yourself out, be useful at church. But finally, verse 14 be saturated with the life of God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. William Booth wrote a hymn, it's in the Salvation Army songbook and it's about standing by the river of God's grace 
And there you are, a sinner, and the river of God's grace is flowing. And you plunge into the river of grace. And some of us here, we are so conscious of our sin and so conscious of our mistakes and so conscious of our failure and so conscious of our history. And we need this morning to plunge into that river of grace or to change the picture, to stand under the waterfall of God's grace and let his undeserved favor wash over us till we're saturated with his grace and then let it flow through us to those around us. The grace comes through us to others, show, so we show his grace. And we, we sit at the foot of the cross, we kneel at the foot of the cross, and we soak in the love of God, that the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ loved me, loved you, and gave himself for you. And you survey the wondrous cross until the love of God floods your heart and burns within you. And then that love flows to those around you. And you get into your room and you, you, you draw near to God in prayer and you know that fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And then you let that fellowship with God flow through into fellowship with God's people. And oh, your life in the church is just, as it were, a foretaste of heaven because you are saturated with the life of God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And you'll look at your hand and you won't see a scar of the cross, but you'll look into your heart and you will see that you cling to the old rugged cross, to the old cross of Christ. You will always be true. Because that's where you found mercy from God, where your sins were forgiven and you were restored and you're going to walk in the power of Jesus' cross and live fully restored until one day you exchange it for a crown. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is full restoration not because we are strong, but because you are mighty. And we pray that we would not be content to be superficial in our discipleship, that we wouldn't be hypocritical and we wouldn't certainly be artificial, but that we might be with our mind, heart, and our will out and out for Jesus Christ. And we pray that this won't just be for this Sunday morning, or this Sunday, but tomorrow, this week, next week, forever, we might be fully restored. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, let's sing that prayer. May the love of God, our Heavenly Father,